But um, Doug had asked me to give a quick talk about office examination of the dizzy patient. And his subtitle on that was How I Do It. But as I started thinking about this, I thought it might be more appropriate to start thinking about should I do it? Is there evidence that we should do this? And is it something I should recommend to you in terms of your evaluation of the dizzy patient? So, you know, as we all are well aware, dizziness can be very, very subjective. It's people can have any kind of comment from feeling a little lightheaded to having true vertigo. It's very common in the United States that constitutes a large part of our health care burden, both in primary care as well as in the emergency room. And, you know, in a, one survey we found that nearly 20% of people um, in this age group, this adult age group, will have an episode of dizziness at some point that they feel needs to be evaluated. In the clinic setting, it's a little different than the emergency room. In the emergency room, you have to worry about all kinds of bad things like strokes and bleeds and uh, problems with respect to medications or cardiovascular issues. But generally, in the clinic, it's going to be much less em emergent. Dizziness um, is generally a sensation of altered orientation as opposed to pure vertigo where there's an illusion of motion. Dizziness can feel like fainting. It can feel like a sense of um, uh, instability or loss of control in a large environment, such as um, psychophysiological dizziness, but lots of different potential sources. As always, the key to the diagnosis in dizziness is looking at our history. It's the old real estate um, statement. You know, what's the key to good real estate? Location, location, location. Well, in dizziness, it's history, history, history. You want to take a good history. Um, really press people on what they're trying to tell you about their dizziness. Don't just let them say, it's really hard for me to describe, and then sort of accept that and go on. You want to really get people to give you the best um, description that you can possibly pull out of them. Determine if the motion is perceived in the absence of movement. If people have what I would refer to as unprovoked dizziness or vertigo, that's an important thing as opposed to dizziness or vertigo that only occurs while they're in the midst of motion. And look for associated symptoms such as neurological problems or auditory symptoms. Some people will say, and sometimes we'll hear from um, the uh, uh, otolaryngology world, well, they aren't feeling like they're spinning, so it cannot possibly be a problem of the ear or the vestibular system, which is not true. I mean, people can have a sensation of linear motion or spatial disorientation, such as tilt. Um, they can have oscillopsia. Um, they can have drop attacks. So it doesn't have to be spinning to equal a vestibular problem. And likewise, just because they are feeling that they're spinning, and this is sort of the classic neurologist referral. Well, my neurologist told me I feel like I'm having a spinning episode, so it must be my inner ear. Well, not necessarily that either. You can have problems within um, prevertebral stretch mechanisms. You can have other sensory abnormalities through the uh, thalamus and uh, uh, midbrain region, uh, visual vestibular interaction centers in the midbrain and cerebellum that can all cause some sensation of movement or a sense of spinning. So these um, neurological problems also can account for that. I'll make the uh, put together a list of the eight questions that must be answered um, during the course of your history with a dizzy patient. Um, and you want to make sure you have a sense of how long they've experienced it, how long the attacks occur, how often it's happening, um, the sensation as we mentioned, is there any precipitating uh, or exacerbating factor with this, any additional symptoms, and then a history with respect to their background in terms of additional disease issues, uh, trauma, et cetera. The examination is pretty straightforward. We, uh, when we start out, we want to look in the ear. We want to make sure we have a good sense of what's happening for them inside the ear, the middle ear, um, and surrounding structures. We want to try to get a good sense of what's happening with regards to their eye movements. And um, if we can put on some lenses or do something to take away their ability to fixate, that occasionally will uncover abnormal eye movements indicative of abnormal stimulation in the vestibular uh, ocular pathways. Um, we want to see if they have spontaneous or valsalva-induced nystagmus. So we can check a fistula test. We can do some positional testing and some head shape testing. And those are some common things to look at with regards to 
the um, actions of the semicircular canals and vestibular system. And then um, we can look at head impulse testing and check other cerebellar uh, and vestibular nerve pathways, looking at, for instance, uh, Romberg or Fukuda testing and pass pointing. So those are all important and good ideas, but and, and that's kind of how I do it. But then as I was putting that all together, I was thinking, well, you know, why do I do these things? And as often the case, a lot of times we do um, our exam or we follow our pathway because that's how we were taught to do it, but not necessarily because anybody said, well, there is good evidence or good data. We, we read a book on physical exam and it says, if you do a fistula test and the person has nystagmus, or if you do a fistula test and the person feels off balance, that that's a good indicator that there's a vestibular problem. But rarely is there any evidence-based component to that in our textbooks or our physical exam skill books or even necessarily in our residency or practice training. We, we just are shown this by our mentors and we sort of our spoon fed, we eat it, and we kind of continue to perpetuate those thoughts. So um, to look at some of this in a more you know, critical way, I thought, well, let's look at some numbers and see what happens. So fistula testing is a very simple thing that we can all do, right? We can put pressure in the ear, either with a pneumatic otoscope, or we can do it with um, just pushing on the tragus, but create that sense of pressure in the external auditory canal onto the eardrum and in the middle ear to try to elicit either a sense of vertigo or, a sen or create nystagmus to indicate or to try to demonstrate that maybe the patient has some sort of a fistula or an endolymphatic uh, or a perilymphatic leak. Um, so House and Riser looked at this a number of years ago. They did it with and without ENG recordings. And um, they found that if you looked at this and compared it to what their gold standard was, was a fistula at the time of explorative surgery that about 58% of the patients had a uh, positive uh, fistula test and a confirmed fistula versus 56 of those patients having complaints or findings um, without a defined fistula. So if we're looking at leak as, a, uh, as the gold standard, the numbers are not significantly different between those that did or did not actually have a fistula at the time of exploration. When they did this with ENG enhancement, the numbers even got worse um, if they were looking for true nystagmus or abnormal eye movement. So as a sensitive test for fistula, it's, if we use that as our gold standard, not particularly good. Healy then later looked at this, and again, looking at perilymphatic fistula visible at the time of surgery, only about 25% of patients had a positive test in that series, 24 with Seltzer and McCabe, um, a better number with uh, a potion when they looked at it, 70 cents, 77%, uh, but then 33% um, in this last study. So it's not a particularly sensitive test. We do it, and I guess if it's, you know, if we can find some positivity, that is somewhat in our um, mind helpful to indicate perhaps there is some issue within that. However, um, when you look at it comparing people with or without the fistula, the numbers are not all that horribly different. In semicircular canal to his sense, Minor, uh, when he reported this in his original series, indicated that about 73% of patients with semicircular canal to Hissen syndrome have some vestibular symptom during the course of positive pressure um, in the canal and fistula <clears throat> testing. But nystagmus um, was only induced in about 30, or excuse me, 43% of those patients with a de Hissen canal. So again, not a horribly sensitive test for picking this up. It's not, it's, it's easy to do, it's inexpensive. In fact, it's essentially free. It's very easy time-wise but not necessarily something that you can hang your hat on or having a tremendous amount of sensitivity. And how about head shake nystagmus? Basically, when we do head shake nystagmus testing, we're having the person shake their head very vigorously side to side for about 30 seconds. This in, in turn um, goes through and, and achieves what's called a charging of the brainstem velocity storage mechanisms. And then when they stop and open their eyes, we're looking for perpetuated nystagmus that beats away from the lesioned or hypoactive side. So a number, again, of different authors, different investigators have looked at head shake nystagmus and looked at the sensitivity and specificity on that. And as you look down this row here of 
you know, the sensitivity is, well, if you were to take out this first one here where they had 100% with the coils, when others were compared with ENG or rotary findings or other vestibular testing, the numbers are all over the board. I mean, we're anywhere from as low as 27% all the way up to 100%. Um, specificity maybe a little bit better in terms of some of the consistencies around 60% as an average. Um, but again, not horribly sensitive nor specific with respect to this test. Um, there were additional series that looked at large numbers of patients, 420 patients in this series. Um, when we look at these, again, neither, none of these off authors found that this is a particularly sensitive nor specific test with respect to correlation with ENG or other testing. Head and and it's become a very, very commonly performed um, exam test trying to find hypoactive vestibular function. And in cases where people have 100% loss, um, complete absence of vestibular function, head impulse testing can be an extremely valuable test. But otherwise, again, we find that the overall um, sensitivity and specificity of this test is not great. And sometimes it's not all that easy to even um, determine whether the patient has an abnormality. They did a study looking at the accuracy amongst expert examiners, which were defined as those people who had done at least six months of a neurotology training, versus people who had done um, no additional training whatsoever. They had 15 subjects and nine controls in this study. And essentially, the experts had lower sensitivity than the non-expert because they were more willing to sort of take the subtle findings and say, well, that's within normal. I don't really see that as a problem. So their, the net that they cast wasn't as broad. But the specificity um, still was only around 80% or so worse than the non-experts. These had um, statistically significant value. but. It's not by any means other than for those people with complete absence um, a, uh, a, a great test. And um, you know when you look at these differences in canal paresis and, and kind of in the gray area between 100% or some partial loss, these numbers become quite a bit worse. 35% sensitivity, pretty good specificity. Um, when the head impulse testing, bedside head impulse testing is compared to calorics, moderate canal paresis of somewhere between 50 and 75 percent, um, the sensitivity goes down to right around 10 percent. So it's not all that great. Um, for, you know, just kind of the quick, how, do, how does this test happen? I think we're all aware of how you do it. Um, essentially what we're doing is we're having the person stare at our nose and quickly turn their head from side to side. If they have intact canal function, they're able to track very easily. Um, however, and this is over-exaggerated because she's not a great actress, but if you have a loss, let's say in her right ear, as the head goes quickly, the eyes deviate with the head and then make a quick catch-up saccade to back to the examiner's nose. Facuda step testing is um, generally uh, believed to be a test of vestibulospinal function and proprioceptive function. It suggests a measure of asymmetry in the labyrinth, typically accepted that rotation is going to work towards the side of deficit or lesion. Um, a study looking at this plus or minus some pre um, Facuda testing head shake compared to caloric testing in unilateral weakness greater than 25%, a large number of patients, almost 736 patients, um, sensitivity was only about 50%, specificity about 61%. So, and when they did a plus or minus head shake uh, before, that didn't change their outcome. So it's unable to really um, define the utility of this as a, in acute labyrinthine deficits. It's more of a chronic thing, but it's also not particularly sensitive nor specific even in chronic dizzy patients. Um, so those are kind of the exam pieces of all of this. And I'm kind of moving through this a bit quickly, I realize, but mainly just uh, to try to allow you to stay awake. But so that we no normally do some auditory testing. We sometimes will go into the vestibular lab looking at VNG, um, sometimes rotating chair if you have that available, computerized posture autography, um, auto rotational testing, um, the video nice tomography. This test basically is used to eliminate fixation. Um, it allows for both X and Y axis assessment. We do a lot of caloric testing and so forth within this. 
This test, when looked at in an evidence-based fashion, um, is established, it's strongly recommended, has a high level of utility, particularly when we're looking for uh, vestibular weakness. Rotational testing, we can either, it is non, unfortunately non-lateralizing the information about how the CNS um, interacts with respect to the peripheral system. Um, there are two different ways to do that. We can either do an earth vertical axis rotation on a chair or a head only rotation. Um, the advantages of the head only rotation is that it's relatively inexpensive, portable, and accessible. Um, you can ex- assess those high um, frequency rotations for the vestibular ocular reflex, and it's good on serial examinations to look for improvement. Unfortunately, the normative data on this isn't all that well established. Um, some people have a tremendous amount of difficulty doing this um, if they're older or have any cervical problems, and you can end up with a fair amount of signal to noise issues. Um, and so, as we kind of go through this, if you don't have this in your clinic or you haven't seen it, it's essentially people listening to this beep that gets faster and faster and faster, and they rotate their head in time to the beep. Do you know anybody who uses this? We use this. And so she's just trying to maintain her eyes on target. And there are really three uh, measures that we're looking for on that. We're looking for um, the gain, you know, in terms of head movement versus eye movement. We're looking for symmetry. And we're looking for phase, making sure that their eyes are moving in the opposite direction of their head. Um, Conventional rotational testing is certainly a better, more physiological way to do this, but it's difficult to find. It's an expensive machine. Um, And so we don't have a tremendous amount of uh, access to this kind of out in the, in smaller towns, certainly in larger cities, it's available. Um, It disadvantages, it's not side specific and, So you end up with simultaneous vestibular stimulation. It's great in bilateral loss, however, to be able to assess that looking for a bilateral weakness versus complete absence. Posturography, there's still controversy regarding how useful this is. Um, It's attempting to try to integrate all parts of your vestibular balance system from the inner ear, the ocular, and vestibulospinal or proprioceptive um, and pressure um, sensors. Um, dynamic visual acuity, I think, is at least on paper, is a great test. Um, we don't necessarily run this in our office, so maybe the third part of my talk should be should I recommend it, and, and I wish we could do this. We don't have a dynamic visual acuity, but when you look at it, um, it tends to have fairly good sensitivity and specificity with respect to um, uncovering or revealing vestibular dysfunction. You're looking for some evidence of retinal image slip. In a test looking, or in a study looking at about 100 subjects, they had um, 100 control participants, five participants with bilateral uh, reduced response, uh, 10 with unilateral reduced vestibular response, and then looking at the acuity on these uh, lindel rings, which I'll show you in a second, basically looking to see um, you know, how much degradation occurred with regards to their acuity as their head rotations were increased. Um, these are the lindold rings, so you just had to kind of determine where the gap is and be able to tell the examiner that. Um, what they basically found was that higher velocity um, rotation was better for uncovering vestibular loss, passive head movement as opposed to active. So, so kind of like the head impulse, somebody turning the head um, was better than active. At higher velocity rates, the sensitivity for detection of unilateral and bilateral loss versus normal was nearly, it was very, very good, 100% um, sensitivity. 94% uh, accuracy, uh, specificity with an accuracy of 95%. Um, so looking at evidence base and all of these things kind of put together, class one uh, evidence, if you recall, is blinded broad spectrum, uh, group of participants, prospective study, and you can read all the rest coming down through class two, three, and four evidence, um, fourth being the worst, and then looking at where that leads to strength of recommendations with respect to evidence-based medicine, either something that's well-established and very useful or predictive all the way to inadequate um, and a very little value, essentially, 
Um, we, this is tough to read, sorry. I was always told if you have to apologize for your slide, you shouldn't use it. But this chart um, I thought was valuable to at least look at. Essentially, class A or, or A rating evidence really comes down to rotational chair and caloric testing. Everything else is either B or worse. And most of the class evidence behind the uh, particular um, test or data is a pretty low, um, low evidence-based uh, class simply because it's either poorly established or um, has not been studied in a prospective fashion. Imaging, we have kind of been through that. Indications for imaging, for us, most of the time, people are showing up with scans or some sort of outside imaging. But most experts would agree if there's any abrupt change in a patient's neurological status with dizziness or vertigo falling into that, then imaging is warranted. So um, with all of that now being said, dizziness is a complex issue. There's a lot of different testing, a lot of different exam findings, a lot of different recommendations that are made, um, a lot of which has just been gleaned from tradition and um, mentoring rather than good evidence-based medicine. Hopefully we'll be able to kind of come down to those that are producing the most diagnostic val validity and utility for us. And with that, um, I'll give you a picture of kind of my part of the country looking out uh, over one of the lakes by us during the winter and uh, say thank you. Mm -hmm.